Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so today we are going to um, continue our discussion about uh, the development of T cells. Uh, we've already discussed how the B cells undergo this uh, pretty rigorous process of uh, creating immunoglobulins on their surface uh, and how they, uh, upon leaving the bone marrow, B cells already have their immunoglobulins uh, made and those B, B cells then undergo uh, a process of screening to make sure that they don't self-react. And eventually the B cells make their way to the uh, secondary lymphoid tissues, such as the thymus, where they are rewarded uh, for being able to pass their tolerance screening and to demonstrate to the immune system that they're able to properly leave the blood and go into places like lymph nodes, uh, at which point B cells are then um, wired up so that now when things bind to their immunoglobulins, they will activate the B cells. And then the B cells go to work, sort of cycling between the blood and the uh, lymph system, going back and forth, back and forth, uh, having an opportunity to pass through all the different uh, lymph nodes uh, of your body um, as they try to look for things that they can bind to, uh, to show that their immunoglobulin is actually useful and valuable. So at the end of last lecture, we shifted gears a little bit and said, now let's take a look at T cells. We said that T cells are also born in the bone marrow, just like B cells are. But importantly, when the precursor of a T cell leaves the bone marrow, it doesn't resemble a T cell at all. It still has nothing that looks like a T cell receptor on its surface. And in many ways, right, that cell... Uh, could very easily just become a natural killer cell and go to work in the immune system. But T cells, in order for them to become T cells, those precursor cells that come out of the bone marrow have to make a pit stop in the thymus, right? And we said that it's in the thymus that these thymocytes, in other words, the precursor cells that have arrived, they've gone through your blood, they came out of your bone marrow, they've arrived in your thymus, they will then be encouraged to become T cells in a process that involves them doing VDJ recombination to make a T cell, T cell receptor and ultimately having to undergo a similar type of self tolerance uh, training or selection process to make sure that they, they don't auto react against your own body as well. Uh, so let's uh, continue our discussion about how that process happens. So you recall, this is taking place inside of the thymus, right? This um, soft tissue organ that's uh, in front of the heart or above the heart between the lungs. And we said last time that if you were to look at a cross section of the thymus, you would find that you'd have all these separate sort of compartments or chambers that are defined by this sort of fibrous tissue capsule in which you would find many, many uh, cells. Right, so in this image on the left, all these little dark spots are the nuclei of individual cells. And we said that you can tell that there are different tissue regions of this um, region of the thymus here. If we look at the cartoon, remember we learned that this part up here is known as the cortex of the thymus, this, this tissue region. And then down here is the medullary region or, or medulla. So the brand new precursor cells of the, of the T cells that arrive and come into the thymus, they are kind of ushered into this cortex region where they have an opportunity, an opportunity to interact with different types of uh, epithelial cells in the thymus. So these sort of orange or yellowish star-shaped uh, things are epithelial cells. And these are the cells that will try to encourage these precursor cells to become T cells. These developing thymocytes, as they are now called, right, because now that these cells are part of the thymus, they are developing thymocytes. They will start doing VDJ recombination, ultimately ending up uh, a few of them out of the initial starting amount that get there succeed in becoming um, these thymocytes that have T cell receptors on their surface. And then in this uh, medullary region of the thymus is where they can interact with other types of um, uh, epithelial cells. These darker orange ones here are these medullary epithelial cells, which will help them do things like do their tolerance training to make sure that they are not 
uh, autoreactive. So you can imagine that if you were to look inside of a thymus and see a multitude of cells like this, you would know that some of them are cells that have just arrived and are not much different than when they left the bone marrow, right? Other cells might be along the way of developing into a T cell. So they might have part or, or, or their whole uh, T cell receptor already formed. And then some of these cells would be already undergoing tolerance training, almost ready to be released into the blood if everything looks good. But if you were to just look at this under a microscope, you would not be able to visually tell the difference, right? So what if you were studying this and wanted to actually follow which cells were in what stages of T cell development? How could you do it? Well, a key would be knowing that as the cell is being encouraged to become a thymocyte, and as that thymocyte is developing its T cell receptor and, and uh, on its way to maturing, that different proteins from different genes inside of these cells would be expressed right, at different points along the developmental way. So if you could use these proteins as sort of like a marker to help you identify you know, certain cells that have this combination of protein markers, right? we know that would be in this stage of development, or certain cells that still have a marker that hasn't gone away yet, might be at this stage of the development. So this idea of using protein markers has really revolutionized the way that we follow the development of immune cells. So that's what this slide is about. So these markers are what we call the CD markers, right? So CD proteins you've already heard about. In fact, when we were first learning about the difference between cytotoxic killer T cells and helper T cells, right? what was the main difference? The main difference was the presence of either CD4 or CD8 co-receptor. Right? These proteins that serve an important function in the two different types of T cells being able to do their job differently, those certainly can serve as markers, CD4 and CD8. One thing I haven't told you about is what does this name CD actually stand for, right? It's kind of funny because even people who only have a passing understanding of T cell function, right? They know that there are those two main C, uh, T cell types, CD8 positive and CD4 positive. And all of you now, right, have a much better understanding of what that four and the eight refer to in terms of the co-receptor, right? But I think very few people actually ask, what does the CD actually stand for? What does it mean? So CD refers to this term, clusters of differentiation. Right? It's kind of a weird, weird set of words, right? Clusters of differentiation, what does that mean? It means exactly what I told you a few minutes ago, that if you realize a cell that is developing, for example, an immune cell, and as it is changing as part of its maturation, different proteins will get expressed at different points, certain proteins will stop being expressed. You could use these as markers, markers that help you differentiate, or maybe I should say, put into different categories or clusters, cells that are on different differentiation pathways. So that's what cluster of differentiation refers to, a, a whole library of different protein marks that immunologists now use in order to be able to figure out a cell that they're looking at, what is it, and how far along the pathway of development is it. Right. Here we can see in this cartoon on the right, right, as the precursor cell that came out of your bone marrow arrives, um, uh, actually, let's not even, let's back up here. Let's just start with a stem cell that's in your bone marrow. Okay, one of these hematopoietic stem cells that give rise to all the different types of uh, cells in your blood, right? Everything from your red blood cells to the platelet manufacturing cells to the leukocytes, the white blood cells, right? And all the different types among them. So that hematopoietic stem cell has certain marks or proteins that it expresses that researchers now know you can look for these. And if you find these proteins on a cell, there's a good bet that the cell, cell is still functioning as a stem cell. So one of these proteins is CD34, right? So cluster of differentiation, you know, mark number 34, 
right? So if you see cells that have CD34 protein on them, those are what we call more stem-like cells. As that stem cell divides and the daughter cells, right, as they divide, they begin to change what proteins are being turned on, turned off, et cetera, et cetera. We now know that CD45, this yellow protein in the cartoon here, is a very useful marker for being able to distinguish that these cells are immune cells right, that are no longer stem cell-like. So you can see all of these cells down here are CD45 positive. And in addition, right, of course, these cells are not just saying I can only express one new protein or take away one new protein. It's waves and waves of proteins, right? So in addition to seeing the CD45 mark that lets you know, oh, these are developing uh, immune cells, you can also look for other marks. Like if you see the CD15 mark, that means this immune cell is on its way to becoming some kind of a granulocyte. Right, like an eosinophil or a basophil, et cetera. CD14 protein on the surface is an indication that this cell is becoming a monocyte. So ultimately it may become uh, a macrophage or maybe a dendritic cell, right? And then you can see here, CD61 is a sign that the cell is becoming a thrombocyte, ultimately something that's going to form into a megakaryocyte and make platelets. So you can see CD3 and CD19 are marks that are useful for telling the difference between cells that are on their way to becoming B cells. And the CD3 mark is useful for identifying cells that are on their way to becoming T cells. So then after you found the CD3 mark and you follow these cells, then you would eventually see, yes, some of them will also gain CD4 and some of them will express CD8, right? So these combination of proteins then are very useful for being able to identify what cell you're looking at. So how do you do this? You say like, well, okay, yeah, but I mean, these are just proteins. So it's not like you can look under a microscope and be like, I think that looks like a CD3 or a CD4 or something like that. How do you do it? You use antibodies to label these cells, antibodies that have, um, different types of fluorescing molecules attached to them, right? So that these, these antibodies, if they're specific for CD4 or CD45 or whatever, they can carry and label these cells with different types of fluorescing molecules that if you then, you know, hit them with a certain laser or something like that, different wavelengths of light uh, can come out. So this data below is uh, very typical data for how we use techniques known as flow cytometry and fax analysis to be able to start with a big pool of many different mixed cell types and actually be able to uh, not only identify different subpopulations of cells in them, but through fax analysis, you can actually physically sort the cells and purify only populations of cells that you are interested in studying. Let's pretend, for example, that you are interested in studying um, the effector T cells. So mature helper T cells and mature cytotoxic T cells that are coming from a blood sample taken from somebody who has recovered from, let's say, uh, SARS-CoV-2, right? So they've recovered from COVID-19. Your group is really interested in seeing what do their T cells look like? So if you take a tissue sample or a blood sample, it's going to be a mix of all kinds of cells in there, right? You want to be able to actually get out and purify the T cells so that maybe you can have a pool of purified T cells just from, you know, that patient that you can study more closely and get more valuable information from. How would you do it? So flow cytometry is a technique whereby a pool of cells in a suspension are passed through a very specialized narrow channel, a channel that is so uh, specifically engineered that only one cell can flow through it at a time in a single file. You'd have all the cells basically going through this, but they can only pass through uh, one cell after another. Right? And then this channel would pass in front of something like a laser a laser that would then excite 
any of those antibodies that you've kind of mixed in there to label different types of proteins on the surface. Right? And depending upon the, dif the, the diffraction of the laser and the light that comes out, you know, your, your computer could have a sensor that actually detects or counts, oh, you know, this cell has the, the blue mark on it that just passed by the laser. This next cell has the blue and the yellow. This one has a green, right? And then you could actually use the software to count out of your big pool of cells. Great, this is how many cells had these combination of marks that I was interested in. But fax analysis takes that technology a step further. Rather than just reading the identity of the cells that are passing by, you actually have the ability that if a cell passes in front of the sensor and it has the combination of signals that you're interested in, you can actually divert that cell to a separate collection chamber, whereas the other cells keep flowing by, all right? So this is what data from that type of analysis looks like. So remember, we said, all right, at first, we're just interested in looking at out of this person's blood sample, there's going to be a lot of cells in the blood sample that aren't really even immune cells, right? So how do we even just look at the immune cells to start with? This is where those CD markers come in. So you look in the upper right here, right? We said all of these immune cells, right? Regardless of what kind that it is, they should have the CD45 mark or protein on their surface, right? So if you go ahead and you treat all these cells in the mix with antibodies that, that detect CD45 and these antibodies have some sort of little fluorescent marker on them, then when you pass them through, you can see that there are two populations, right? So Every single little blue dot on this here is an individual cell that passed in front of the uh, sensor, right? And then the software sort of tells you where that cell kind of fell in terms of whether or not it had the mark or not, right? And from that, you can see two groups. These cells over here were the ones that had the CD45 on your surface, right? So you say, oh, those are immune cells. The rest of it might be garbage, right? Cells that you don't care about. So you can gate, you can actually gate specifying the software. Okay, I'm gonna run these cells through again. This time, I want you to physically divert any cells that are within this sort of set of signal boundaries, right? Into another collection uh, chamber, right? Then you take these cells and you say, what am I interested in next? I'm interested in T cells, right? And you say, in addition to CD45, T cells have CD3, this, this red uh, protein on them. So you do the same thing again. You take that population of immune cells that you purified once already, pass them through, and now you gate only on the cells that have the CD3 mark, right? And now you only collect those. And then the last thing you wanna do is you wanna tell the difference between helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. So you pass those cells through it again, this time, looking for the CD4 versus the CD8 mark, right? And that's how you then get two populations, right? So that's kind of amazing if you think about it, because these days you can do this so that the cells are actually intact and still alive, right? So now you have purified populations of CD4 helper cells and CD8 killer cells purified from the original big mix of a whole bunch of different cells. All right. I thought you'd find that interesting because I think some of you are interested in these types of um, technologies and certainly you've heard of CD marks before. Uh, this helps you, I think, appreciate that more. And I wanted to uh, raise your awareness that these types of techniques are ones that we use now to be able to purify cells, to be able to do additional experiments just on cytotoxic T cells or just on helper T cells that came um, from a patient. Okay. All right. So the appearance or disappearance of these different proteins in the cell that are useful as CD marks, right? And I should stress, just because they're all called CD something, whether it's CD34 or 44 or 4 and 8, it doesn't mean that they're all similar proteins, right? Because these could be proteins that have a diverse range of functions and in reality have nothing to do with each other. It's just that these are the sets of proteins that the cell will regulate as part of changing, right? Uh, from one developmental stage to the next. Uh, so don't be confused about that, right? It's not like, oh, CD proteins are all a family of, of special CD proteins. 
um, that are all similar. No, it just means that these are useful marks to use. Here's an example of how we can appreciate that these CD marks are very useful for following development of a thymocyte. So here we're looking at a green uncommitted progenitor cell that came out of your bone marrow, went through the blood, and now it's entered the thymus, right? And we're saying, hmm, what kinds of CD marks does it have compared to later on once that cell has become a uh, committed thymocyte on the way to becoming a T cell? So certain marks you can see, like I already told you, the CD34 mark is a mark that's useful for telling whether or not the cell is more stem cell-like or if it's more like a differentiated cell. So the uncommitted progenitor cell, you'd find the CD34 protein on it, right? Whereas by the time it started differentiating and turning into something like a T cell, that CD34 mark, you would no longer find it on there. Right? Other marks, uh, for example, there are certain cell adhesion marks that are more typical of a stem cell that are lost once the cell is differentiating. Look at these group right here of CD signals. Right? These are ones that very clearly were not found when the cell was still sort of like a stem cell that arrived in the thymus. Later on, as it turns into a thymocyte, right? that's when you start seeing the presence of these marks. Right? And importantly, at this point, this is not a full-blown T cell yet, right? You can see the status of the T cell receptor genes, right? In the stem cell, they are still germline. They are whatever you're born with, right? All the blocks of the Vs, the Ds, and the Js, nothing's been chosen yet, right? Whereas in the developing thymocyte, VDJ recombination is on its way. It's happening, right? So things are beginning to rearrange. Importantly, during the rearrangement, of the VDJ gene fragments to make a T cell receptor, this T cell doesn't express CD4 or CD8 co-receptor yet, right? Because the expression of those proteins only matters if the cell really has a T cell receptor on its surface, right? Because after all, the CD4 and the CD8 co-receptors are meant to help the T cell receptor function. So when that stem precursor-like cell first enters the thymus, right, it, it's undecided, you know, it, it doesn't know what it wants to do. It was just wandering around aimlessly through your blood, right, it just so happens in the thymus, right. It starts interacting with thymic epithelial cells in the cortex of the thymus, right, and these cells are the ones that are going to encourage it, you know, to become a T cell. Right up until now, it's been kind of like, hey, I don't know what I want to do. And, and then these thymus epithelial cells, like, hey, you know, you should really become a T cell, you know, because uh, that'd be really useful. You'd be really good at it. Um, you know, do something useful with your life. You know, well, actually, I'm having a weird little family flashback there for a moment. But anyhow, how does it do it? Right. It does it through the interaction of receptors interacting with the cell surface, right, as the two cells are touching. So here, this gray cell on the top is the thymocyte, right, that uh, is only now becoming kind of encouraged to become a T cell. The thymic epithelial cells, right, have this protein on their surface known as notch ligand, right, what a weird name, right. It's called notch ligand because it's the thing that, um, binds to a receptor on the surface of the thymocyte called notch one. And notch one is a wonderful example of a very primitive type of receptor. Now receptors, as we've learned, right, are proteins whose job it is to actually detect something else bound to it. For example, another protein or some kind of small molecule, right? And transmit signal into the cell telling the cell to somehow change its gene regulation in response to that signal. Right? If you think about it, one of the most sort of primitive ways that you can imagine a receptor functioning is if the binding of that receptor to something like a ligand that arrives on the outside changes that receptor in a way that part of that receptor is then available to come loose 
and actually end up signaling inside of the cell. So the NOTCH1 receptor is like that. It has these two parts, right? It has this blue part that's in the cytoplasm, then this uh, green part that sticks out of the cell, right? And then this middle part is just the intermembrane part that spans the cell membrane. When the NOTCH ligand that's on a thymic epithelial cell binds to the green part of the NOTCH1 receptor, it literally tears it apart, right? So it shows a pair of scissors here, but really a, a lot of times it's even just the physical, the physical uh, stress of another cell pressed up against that causes the blue part of the NOTCH1 receptor to float free. And that blue part is the right shape where it will happily be transported into the nucleus of the cell and it will go ahead and bind to different regulatory sites surrounding genes, such as promoters or enhancers of genes that are involved in now waking up the uh, thymocytes machinery for doing things like dividing and starting to do VDJ recombination. Right. So we can think of this kind of like peer pressure. Right? So what's ultimately going to happen is the actions of the NOTCH1 signaling begin to start the process of the precursor cell wanting to do things like VDJ recombination. Right? And so here again, this is just a review, right, of VDJ recombination in developing thymocytes. Uh, it's very similar to the VDJ recombination that takes place in developing B cells. The difference is in thymocytes, you have way more things like V blocks and J blocks to choose from. So if we're talking about a thymocyte that ultimately is going to form an alpha beta T cell receptor right, and be a functional T cell in our immune system, it's going to be rearranging its alpha chain locus up here. It's going to be rearranging its beta chain locus down here, right, on two different chromosomes. Right? So you can see the chromosomes labeled over here. So this is the VDJ that, that you've become very familiar with. Ultimately, it results in the formation of an alpha beta T cell receptor. Right. So this is where things get a little bit more complicated. Okay. Because the alpha beta T cell receptor, the one on the left here, the yellow and the green alpha and beta chain, this is the one that we've been talking about up until now. So T cells that have uh, uh, the ability to function as a cytotoxic CD8 T cell or a helper CD4 T cells, this is the kind of T cell receptor that they cook up and make through VDJ recombination and have on their surface, right? There's another type of T cell though that gets made, right? And those T cells have these two other chains instead. So instead of the alpha and the beta type of T cell receptor chain, you have some T cells that make what we call gamma and delta chains, right? In which case, these cells would be called gamma delta T cells. And alpha beta T cells versus gamma delta T cells, they have different functions in our immune system. But the thing that gets very confusing is that the point at which they become either an alpha beta T cell or a gamma delta T cell is kind of like an overlapping process. Right? So this is the flow chart of how an uncommitted progenitor um, precursor cell that enters the thymus eventually becomes either an alpha beta T cell or a gamma delta T cell. So we learned that these stem cells, when they enter the thymus, they have CD34 a protein. So that's one way that researchers can identify that they're looking at an uncommitted progenitor cell. Okay. The epithelial cells inside the thymus begin to sort of pressure or encourage the uh, uncommitted cell to become a thymocyte and sort of start thinking about being a T cell. Right? So here, a few days after the uncommitted progenitor cell has entered the thymus, within a few days, you would find that it is turned into a uh, committed T cell progenitor. Right, or a thymocyte. Right? And at this point, markers such as CD2 on its surface are useful for knowing that this cell is in this stage over here. Importantly, we call this a committed cell 
because it's now committed to the idea of becoming a T cell. And we also say it is double negative, right? What do we mean by double negative? Ultimately, right, if this became an alpha or is going to become an alpha beta T cell, it's going to have CD4 or CD8 co-receptor on its surface, right? In the end, it's going to be single positive for either CD4 positive or single positive for CD8 protein, right? But at this early stage, it has neither the CD4 nor the CD8. So that's why we say the cell is committed to becoming a T cell, but at this point it's double negative. Neither of the co-receptors are present or expressed. So at this point, you see this junction, this fork in the road. This is where the VDJ recombination is taking place for the first time. And there are three loci that the oven mitt or oven mitts go to work on to start this whole VDJ recombination process. Right? They are the site that has all the VDJ fragments for making the beta chain. Right? And there's two other sites, a site that has the fragments for making a gamma chain and a locus that has all the fragments for making a delta chain. So the oven mitt will actually start trying to make all three of these chains at the same time, right? So the oven mitt's just going around trying to do the VDJ recombination at these three different sites. If it turns out that this developing thymocyte succeeds in making a productive gene fragment rearrangement at the gamma as well as the delta chain loci, then guess what? That's all as far as it needs to go because the T cell receptor that it can put together with this gamma and delta is the brown and um, sort of beige, well, that's what the cartoon shows it as, right? Gamma delta T cell receptor, at which point this is a committed gamma delta T cell, right? and it's pretty much ready to go to work. Gamma delta T cells do not have to undergo the same rigorous self-tolerance training that other T cells, the alpha beta T cells have to do because of their role. The gamma delta T cells function as part of our immune system in a way that's not concerned with trying to identify novel antigenic signals that are coming in from the outside. Gamma delta T cells are more like maintenance cells. They go to work just making sure that the cells of our tissues look healthy, and there's no sign of disease. As a result, the number of possible shapes of gamma delta T cell receptors, the antigen binding uh, domain or affinity domain, right, is far less variable because it only needs to make certain variations of certain shapes that we've evolved to look out for as being important hallmarks or signs that there's something wrong with one of our cells uh, or our tissue is damaged or diseased. Okay, so that means some of these developing thymocytes just become gamma delta T cells at this point. However, if the developing thymocyte succeeds in making the beta chain a productive rearrangement of the VDJ gene fragments and now can make a beta chain, at this point, it's on its way to becoming an alpha beta T cell. So what happens? The cell can detect that and says, ooh, I'm making beta chain. I'm probably going to become an alpha beta T cell in order for my alpha beta T cell receptor to work when it's ready. I have to have CD4 or CD8 co-receptor ready, right? But because at this point, it has not finished making the T cell receptor, in a way it's like it doesn't know which one it's gonna need. So it makes both, right? So the cell starts turning on production of both CD8 and CD4 at the same time. So now we say this thymocyte is double positive. Right? Now this gets really confusing because look, the chart suddenly goes back to calling this uncommitted, all right? The nomenclature here, I wish they hadn't used these words because I think it's kind of sloppy, right? They made you say that up here, this developing precursor cell is committed to becoming a thymocyte, 
right? Now over here, somehow it's made it sound like it's changed its mind, right? No, because what it's saying here is at this point, yeah, it's still committed to becoming a T cell, right? It's gone pretty far along the path. It's just uncommitted as to which type of T cell it's going to become, CD4 or CD8, right? And it has both on its surface. At this point, it will try to make the alpha chain part of the alpha beta T cell receptor. So the oven mitt goes back to work trying to rearrange now the alpha locus, but in a weird kind of uh, sort of, uh, you know, mechanism that oven mitt still has the ability to go and work on the gamma locus and the delta locus, right? Because those loci are still kind of there. So there's another possibility that this time around, right? The oven mitt manages to make a gamma and delta chain again, at which point here's another junction or fork in the road this T cell will now give up on being an alpha beta T cell and it'll just be satisfied being a gamma delta T cell again, right? So there's two opportunities to make gamma delta T cells that then go off and do gamma delta T cell function. However, if it does succeed in making the alpha chain, now you're in business, right? Because now you have the yellow and green alpha beta T cell receptor that we all know and love so well, because this is the one that people get excited about. You know, when you say T cell, people think about helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells. Very few people think about the lowly gamma delta T cell, right? But we'll talk more about those later and see why they're very important. Here you see now this T cell receptor needs to go ahead and somehow be part of this T cell deciding, is it going to be CD8 or CD4 single positive? Okay, so this is just another way of uh, looking at that. Remember these different gene loci that code for the V, the D, the J fragments that make up the, uh, the T cell receptor chains, right? So at first, the oven mitt will go to work on these three of them, the beta chain with its separate blocks to choose from, the gamma and the delta chain with their blocks to choose from. Right. If the VDJ recombination succeeds in making productive or usable gamma and delta chains, right, you end up just making gamma delta T cell receptor. And then this gamma delta T cell matures, leaves the thymus, and it migrates into the tissues of your body to start looking for signs of diseased or unhealthy tissue. Right. However, if the beta chain is what rearranges, then the beta chain, just like when the B cells were first making immunoglobulin, right? We said that in B cells, the B cells try to make the heavy chain of the immunoglobulin first, because that's the hard one, right? Because the heavy chain involves V, D, and J blocks successfully coming together, right? If it can pull that off, right? Then it can try to make the light chain to finish off the immunoglobulin. But remember, when the heavy chain is made in immunoglobulin, remember I gave you that analogy, just like a carpenter making furniture, right? It has template, he has templates, templates that can quickly check to make sure that the protein that is being made from this recombination actually is the right shape before you move on to the next step in making the table or the B cell, the next step in making light chain. So in developing thymocytes, it's a similar type of story. Once it's successfully made the beta chain, it needs to make sure that this beta chain looks right before it wastes any time trying to make the alpha chain. So the way it checks out the beta chain is by using this other protein, this gray thing here, okay, which is a pre-TCR uh, protein that helps check out the shape of this, um, of this beta chain. Okay. And this is how it works. So this pre-TCR receptor right, is put together by the beta chain that the cell just made and this PT alpha protein that kind of uh, comes up next to it, right? And tries to fit up next to it. And if the beta chain is the right shape to be a good, decent beta chain, then these things will come together. But this is a little wacky. Look at the way it does this. So the PT alpha comes up against this beta chain protein. So of course, you know, this is not the only beta chain protein molecule that's on the whole cell because the cell is now making protein from this beta chain gene rearrangement. So there's other 
of these beta chains on its surface, right? And so other PT alpha molecules can come and check those out. And the way it checks it out is it forms this weird dimer structure. So on the left is the pair of PT alpha and beta chain that's on the left here. And on the right is the pair of PT alpha and beta chain over here, right? And if the beta chain is the right shape, then this bridge or the super dimer bridge will form, right? And the resulting change in the shape of proteins because it formed this bridge. So now these proteins are some sort of weird shape now, right? That's the right shape to go ahead and attract these other helper proteins like the CD3, the zeta chain that you remember are an important part of helping the mature T cell receptor signal into the cytoplasm properly. So once these are attracted to this super dimer bridge that's formed, this tells the cell, hey, looks good so far. The beta chain looks good. We got to get rid of this PT alpha thing that's just helping it to make this weird bridge. Instead, we need to make the real alpha chain protein, right? So that's why the oven mitt goes back to work. And now hopefully it makes a functional alpha chain. And now you have a complete T cell receptor uh, complex. Okay, so this cartoon uh, is a nice way of kind of summarizing what we just talked about. So we're looking at inside the thymus and inside the thymus, right? There's uh, progenitor cells, precursor cells of thymocytes that came from the bone marrow that have been flowing through your blood. Some of them by chance happen to get into capillaries that are uh, flowing through your thymus Right? And so these progenitor cells that happen to be flowing by, they might stick to different types of receptors or other proteins that are on the inside surface of the capillary here that let them know that they've arrived at this interesting place. Right? They've been zooming through the blood vessels. Everything just looks like I'm inside of a tunnel, right? except for now it's getting narrower and narrower, and now the tunnel's getting wider and wider. I have no idea where I am. But oh, right, these precursor cells, when they happen to pass through the blood that's going through the thymic tissue, there are certain marks that they're interested in, right? Because they have receptors on the surface, they stick to them and they leave the blood uh, and are encouraged through associations with epithelial cells at first to proliferate, right? And then they're moved into the cortex where they begin to start their process of um, committing to becoming a T cell, right? So at this point, they are double negative T cells committing through the peer pressure of epithelial cells like this blue star-shaped thing, giving them notch one signaling, right? They'll go through the rearrangement of their beta chain genes, right? While also at the same time doing the gamma delta, but let's just say for uh, simplicity's sake, right? It successfully rearranges the beta genes. It checks out the resulting pre-TCR using the pre-T alpha protein and that weird little bridge thing Right. Um, if that works out, then the cells will rearrange their alpha um, locus, right? and then you'd end up with a functional T cell receptor, alpha beta T cell receptor, and then you'll have another checkpoint to make sure that this T cell receptor looks good. Right? Uh, and this is still taking place in the cortex because now right, they will move back down into the medulla or the medulla where they will undergo their tolerance training. Right? If along the way they became gamma delta T cells, right, the gamma delta T cells don't have to undergo that highly rigorous tolerance training. Because again, when we will look at this in a future lecture, the gamma, D gamma delta T cells have a much narrower, narrower selection of possible shapes that they could be. And these shapes all come sort of pre-programmed so that these gamma delta T cells don't have to undergo any sort of like double checking to make sure that they, you know, improperly bind things. It's almost like your immune system just trusts that the gamma delta T cells will be okay and they go off and look for unhealthy tissue, right? Whereas the alpha beta T cells, the alpha beta T cells, right? They represent really random shaped T cell receptor antigen binding domains. So they have to undergo uh, self-tolerance training, just like B cells, when the B cells first made their immunoglobulins. And that takes place back in the medulla or the medulla. 
Okay, so this is a nice reminder then that lymphocytes like B cells and T cells, right? I already stressed to you that I want you to think about how they're always, you know, doing their job by going between your blood and lymph, blood and lymph around and around and around, All right? So this is a nice summary of that. Both T cells and B cells are first born in primary lymphoid tissue, such as your bone marrow here, right? The B cell, by the time it leaves the bone marrow, it already has aminoglobulin on its surface and it's past tolerance training, right? Central tolerance training in the bone marrow and then the B cell, the immature B cell passes, hopefully passes peripheral tolerance training in the blood. And then if it doesn't get into any trouble and it eventually arrives in secondary lymphoid tissue like the spleen or the lymph node, right? Then the B cell is rewarded. The wiring of its aminoglobulins are set up so that now the B cell is mature. It's still naive because it hasn't bound anything uh, on its on its unique uh, Ig to this to this point, right? But it's mature, so that now if anything binds to it, right, the B cell will activate, and then the B cell is then released, goes through the lymph, eventually re-enters our circulation at the level of our shoulders, where the uh, lymphatic system reconnects with our blood, right, and then the B cell goes between, flowing through the blood all around the body right, into certain lymph nodes. If it doesn't see anything, it flows back through the lymph system, gets back into the blood, around and around and around, right? The T cell is slightly different, right? The T cell, when it leaves the bone marrow, it doesn't have T cell receptor, right? So it has to go into the thymus, where it develops its T cell receptor, undergoes its training, right? And then goes to the blood, where it also has to find its way to secondary lymphoid tissues, where they can then do their job, right? And the B cells and the T cells together go between the blood and the lymph, blood and the lymph, right? And so I showed you this cartoon on the right last time. It's a nice reminder that the lymphatic system is not directly connected to our vast um, circulatory system, right? It's more in charge of just draining things that are coming out of the capillaries, right? And that fluid that contains all kinds of waste products, bits and pieces of dead cells, lots of water, Right? And potentially pathogens or antigens from pathogens have the opportunity to pass through a series of lymph nodes where things get cleaned up. And then really the only place they reconnect with the circulatory system is through um, the uh, lymphatic thoracic duct and lymphatic duct up at the shoulders. I did tell you last time that the lymphatic vessels, one of the ways they work is that they're very porous at the ends. Right, so where these lymph vessels are draped over our capillary beds, there's all kinds of fluid and nutrients leaking from the capillary walls to feed all of the cells in this tissue, right? Gases like oxygen, right? Uh, carbon dioxide are being moved back and forth here. Right? So all of this fluid with all the stuff that's in it has to be drained from the tissue and they, that's what these lymphatic vessels are, right? They are the gutter system. If you were to zoom in, let's say we zoom into the tips of one of these here, you would see that the end of the lymphatic vessel is very porous, right? Lots of openings between the cells. So lots of fluid is draining in here, just like a gutter, right? And this gets excess fluid away from our tissues. Importantly, that fluid is mostly water that then can be cleaned up in our lymph system. And this is going to pick up all kinds of junk, just like a gutter. That has, has valves in it that prevent the fluid from backing up, right? So these are like one-way channel. Now, you might wonder, how does the fluid, lymphatic fluid from someplace like your lower body actually go up against gravity up through your lymph nodes, right? And, and back into um, your blood, right? Well, unlike our, lymph, uh, unlike our circulatory system, our circulatory system, of course, our blood is pumped by our heart, right? That's what propels our blood around. Our lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. It's just a series of these gutters all over the place, right? So what moves your lymph system around are your muscle movements, right? Because every time you move your muscles, right? Your muscles are squeezing against your lymphatic system. And because the lymph vessels have these one-way valves in them, as you squeeze it, right? The fluid can only go one direction. And that's what propels the material through your lymphatic system. That's why, 
you know how like your auntie or grandma right always tells you you know oh if you have a cold go out get some exercise it's good for you right and you're always like no nah, no nah, nah. that's like an old old uh you know nonsense home remedy type of thing but it's true right because the more you physically move the more you move your lymph through your lymphatic system and the move the more you move your lymph through your lymphatic system the better opportunities your immune system has for having immune cells exposed to check out what it is that's actually draining from your different tissues, right? So absolutely, right? Even if you're not feeling well, get up, go for a walk, because that's what we evolved to do. We didn't evolve to sit on our butts playing PlayStation for like six hours, right? We evolved to be moving around. Right, so that's why our lymph system is designed this way. Okay, last slide, because I know we're out of time, but this is just a summary slide, because a couple of you have asked me about this idea of our blood and lymph never mixing, right? Uh, and I said, yeah, it's just like fresh water coming into your home and sewage water leaving your home, right? Uh, think about your bathroom, right? So your bathroom has a fresh water supply leading from the plumbing of your house right up through the walls and into your bathroom. And so that feeds things like your sink, your tub, your toilet, right? That's all from the same fresh water supply. Importantly, right, after that water is used, like it came into the tub, came into the sink, came into the toilet, it's gonna be collected and it's gonna be sent off as your wastewater, right? Think about this. There is no example in your house of the fresh water supply directly connecting to the wastewater supply right? You don't really think about that, but it's true. In all of these cases, right, the fresh water leaves the fresh water supply before it has to be collected and enter the wastewater supply. So that's just like your blood and lymph, because here the wastewater, right, goes off to a sewage treatment plant where it goes through these different chambers of being progressively more cleaned up before eventually it leaves the water treatment plant as clean water again and comes back to your residential uh, water supply, right? So in the same way, the waste material that's in your lymph fluid that was collected from all of your tissues goes through a series of lymph nodes to be eventually cleaned up and that clean water reintroduced into your circulatory system again. The key difference is along the way, right, is the opportunity for your immune system to check out what's coming through these various lymph nodes, right, to look for evidence of things like pathogens. All right, let's go ahead and stop there. Sorry I went over time, but I figured it's better just to finish up those last couple of slides.